So good evening. And it's wonderful to talk to an audience rather than talk to a Zoom screen. Nice to see so many of you here this evening. So this is the ABC of galaxy evolution. And uh, we've all seen galaxies, either for real, through a telescope, or we've seen pictures of galaxies from various telescopes around the world. Some of them are beautiful structures like this. Some are individual galaxies. Some appear to be pairs of galaxies or galaxies interacting with each other. A lot of them are beautiful spiral galaxies, this one with a number of spiral arms. Some look a little bit different with a couple of spiral arms. There are other galaxies that don't look quite the same, elliptical galaxies which don't have quite the same aesthetic appeal. But the question is, where did all these galaxies come from? We live in a universe that seems to be full. At least the observable part of our universe seems to have a trillion galaxies in it. So where did they all come from? So this talk is to take you through what I consider to be the three basic elements of understanding about galaxies. And that is the ABC, where A stands for accretion, meaning that galaxies were formed by the accretion of matter or the accumulation of matter, if you like, under gravity. Where did this matter come from? From the Big Bang. That was a subject of a different talk that I gave you a couple of years ago. B is for black holes because as far as we can tell, it looks like most, if not all, galaxies have a black hole at the center. Some of these black holes appear to be feeding in the sense that material is falling into that black hole and producing energy. Some of these black holes are quiescent, i.e. quiet, like the one at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. That's the A and the B. And the C stands for collisions because galaxies grow by collisions and mergers with other galaxies over a time period of many billions of years. So we're going to look at the A and the B and the C. Where does the story start? Well, all, star all stories, of course, start at the beginning. And in this case, that means the beginning of everything, which I took you through a couple of years ago. I think it was 2019. So back in the very beginning, everything that we now see in the observable universe, all of those trillions of galaxies, all of the stars in all of those trillions of galaxies that currently occupy the observable universe that we can see, all of that stuff used to be in a volume the size of a golf ball. Okay? And the golf ball was not completely uniform. There were little ripples, little undulations, little variations in density and temperature and that's what I like to think of as the dimples in this cosmic golf ball. The universe expanded from this point of the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. The universe expanded and at some point turned transparent. And that's when the light of the early universe was released. And that light we now see as the cosmic microwave background. But that was an awful long time ago. When we look at the universe now, we see not a universe bathed in light. We see a few pockmarks of light. We see individual islands. We see galaxies, albeit a very large number of them. We see individual galaxies. So how did we go from a universe which was basically a soup of particles and light, how do we go from that to a universe full of galaxies? Well, essentially, all of our understanding of how the universe came to be is based on, yes, a few individuals thinking about it and trying to apply the rules of physics, but a lot of our understanding has come in the last few decades because of computer simulations. It's a very complex problem to say, how do we start from the Big Bang and how do we end up here now? But our understanding has developed because we can now use computer simulations. We now have the computing power to ask the question, what if I start with a whole load of matter and then let gravity do its stuff? How does that end up as the structures that we see today in the universe? So there's an awful lot of simulations over the last 20 or so years. I'm not going to go through all of them. There's just a selection of some of them on the left-hand side there. I've just picked one suite of simulations called the illustrious simulations, and I'm using those to take images and videos to illustrate what I'm saying this evening. So we start with 
the cosmic golf ball, literally just centimeters in size in the very early universe. And we've said that in a little while, in a, in a few hundred thousand years, it expands until the light is released, and then we see the cosmic microwave background. But over the next billions of years, not thousands of years, but over billions of years, that cosmic golf ball expands and eventually gravity takes over and forms what we can perhaps call the cosmic web. Let's see how that happens in the first simulation here. We're taking not the entire observable universe, we're just taking a cube of matter. We're filling it in the computer sense. We're doing this computer simulation. We're filling it with matter, and we're putting a little bit of variation in density throughout this particular cube, and then we let gravity do its stuff and see what happens in the simulation. And the small variations in density grow, and we start to see filaments start to form and voids start to form, and we end up with what you might call the cosmic web. You see where these filaments cross each other, you start to get very high density regions. These white blobs here where filaments intersect, this is the regions, these are the places where clusters of galaxies and individual galaxies will start to form. And we're going to look in a little more detail at one of these white blobs in just a short while. But that gives us the big picture of how we go from something that's almost uniform to something that has definite long range structure, these filaments and voids in the cosmic web. And it's a slightly different colored version uh, here, just to reiterate the fact that it's where these filaments tend to intersect with each other, where the galaxies are forming. And by using these simulations, scientists can start to understand that matter actually drains down these filaments and starts to pool into these regions which will become galaxies. It's not just a question of start with a lot of matter, which was born in the Big Bang, let gravity do its stuff. It's not quite that simple, because if that's all that's in the equation, as it were, you don't get the right output. When it comes to running these simulations, you also have to take into account that once gravity is doing its stuff and making a lot of this matter collapse into denser and denser regions, you have to take into account that stars will form. And if stars form, stars die. And if stars die, they go supernova or generate black holes. And you can suddenly get a lot of gas being generated, which is expelled outwards. So although gravity is trying to collapse all of the matter generated in the Big Bang, stars are doing their best to slow down that collapse of matter. So it's a little bit of a balancing act between gravity trying to pull everything together and the outflowing gas from supernova and from black holes, which tend to impede that collapse. And you have to take that into account if you want to get the right results from your simulations. Ultimately, what we would like is to be able to run a simulation and then say, that's why we get galaxies that look like this. This is just a selection of some of the galaxies picked out of the sky. Some of them are spiral galaxies, like our Milky Way, and they tend to, little, tend to be a little bit bluish in color. Those are indicated on the left-hand side of this particular diagram. They're bluish, they're disk-like, and they have spiral structures. Some galaxies are quite different, and those are on the red side of this chart, and they tend to be a little redder in color and quite often don't have any particular structure. They seem to be just amorphous blobs a little bit like rugby balls full of stars, but none of the spiral structures that we see in the disk galaxies. But ultimately, we would like to be able to explain any galaxy that we happen to pick in the sky to say, yes, we understand how that galaxy came to be. So firstly, we're going to look at the first of the ABC. We're going to look at accretion. Before we look at a video that shows the accretion process, I'm just going to say a few words about how the simulations actually were carried out. Ideally, a simulation will run from very early, soon after the Big Bang, all the way to the present day. And if we run it to the present day, we should be able to compare it with the galaxies in the sky and say, does it look right? Have we got something that predicts a universe that we actually live in? In principle, you could run the simulation into the future. But given that we don't know what's going to happen in the future, we have nothing to compare with. If we stop the simulations as of now, we can compare with what we see 
as of now. And as I've said, we have to take into account not only the fact that gravity is trying to accrete all of this matter, but we have to take into account that the universe is actually chock full of something else, dark matter as well. In addition to all of the hydrogen that exists out there, there's even more of this mysterious substance which we call dark matter. We know about its effects, but we don't actually know what it is. That's an ongoing area of research to try and understand the nature of dark matter. But it has to be in the mix. It has to be in the simulations in order to give us a universe that looks like the one we're living in. And as I've mentioned earlier, we also have to take into account that stars are being born during this process, and stars will live, and the more massive stars will die quite quickly uh, in supernova and might generate black holes, and that might be an outpouring of energy which has to be taken into account as the simulations run. The illustrious simulation, the one I've chosen as a point of illustration, the illustrious simulations ran during those years in the, in the mid-teenies, and they used 20 million CPU hours. CPU is just computer processing unit. Just treat that as a computer. So it effectively ran for 20 million computer hours. And they learned a lot. The people that generated this simulation learned a lot during this uh, run of the simulation, and they realized how they could make it better. So they tweaked the code, they put in more physics, if you like, more astrophysics. Let's take into account this and that and the other to try and make sure that it accounts for all aspects of stellar evolution when you're trying to work out what the galaxies are doing. And they came up with a modified version of Illustris. Did they call it Illustris version 2? No, they didn't. They decided to call it Illustris the next generation because they're all Star Trek fans. So that's now known simply as TNG. For short, I'll just call it TNG. And if you want to see some of the images and some of the videos in the illustrious um, uh, simulations, there's a web page link down the bottom there. The TNG simulations ran for not 20 million CPU hours, but 200 million CPU hours over the next um, few years. It still only took a year or two to run the simulations because computers were faster. So you could still get through 200 million CPU hours. You don't run this on your desktop. You run it on a supercomputer. Otherwise, you will be around for an awful long time. So it takes many months to run these simulations on a supercomputer. If you did decide to run it on your desktop PC or Mac, it would take about 20,000 years to run uh, to give you something comparable. So these simulations are not simple. They are simple in terms of the input is just matter and gravity and a little bit of stellar astrophysics, but the complexity is simply how many molecules, how many stars, how many galaxies they are trying to simulate. It's simply the scale of numbers. The TNG simulations were carried out on different spatial scales. They looked at a cube of the universe and what that was doing, and they took a cube that's 300 megaparsecs on a side. Just a reminder that um, uh, 300 megaparsecs is something like 100, 300 megaparsecs is something like 1,000 million light years, roughly three light years to a parsec. So they did it on large scales so that they could see, are we getting the large scale structure of the universe right? Are we getting the filaments and the voids, et cetera, right? But to see detail as to what's going on where perhaps two filaments uh, overlap or where there's a knot which is particularly dense and a lot of galaxies are being formed, they did calculations on a smaller scale of 50 megaparsecs or about 150 million light years. And to make sure that they've got the, uh, the whole structure right, they also did calculations on a scale which is intermediate. So TNG 50, TNG 100, TNG 300 refer to the size of the box in which the simulation was running. And again, just a reminder about light years and parsecs. One parsec is three and a bit light years, and amateur astronomers tend to prefer light years because it's sort of intuitive how far light travels in a year. But most astrophysics, well, virtually universally, astrophysicists work in parsecs rather than in light years. So just to remind ourselves, 
the Milky Way is something of order 150,000 light years across. So that's about 50 kiloparsecs. And in terms of the distance between galaxies, if we think of the distance between the Milky Way and Andromeda, that distance is about 2.5 million light years, or a little bit less than a megaparsec. So with parsecs, all you have to remember is the distance between stars is about a parsec, and the distance between galaxies is about a megaparsec. That's the sort of only yardstick you need to think about what's going on inside galaxies and what's going on between galaxies. So megaparsec, the distance between galaxies. That's really all you have to remember. So let's have a look at the first simulation to come out of TNG. So we're looking at where filaments have met. One of the white blobs in, in the blue uh, simulation I showed you a few slides back, we're looking at where filaments are meeting. So a filament is coming down from the top, and a filament is coming in from the bottom, and a filament is coming in here. So we're looking at where filaments meet, and matter is streaming down those filaments and being collected or accumulating or accreting in this particular area. So let's run this simulation over a few billion years. More dense matter is shown as the brighter colors here. And so matter is streaming down from all of these directions, and it's starting to swirl like water going down a bath plug hole. And we're starting to see, we can see little blobs coming in. That didn't seem to want to attach itself. Another little bit is coming in. It is fairly chaotic. It is not a regular accumulation of matter. It's a very chaotic process. But you can see that it's starting to swirl, and you can start to see where the shape of spiral galaxies come from as matter streams into this area. Notice that the edges of this particular simulation are now getting rather dark, indicating that a lot of the matter that was in those regions has now been depleted because so much of it is now collecting or accreting in this central region, which is the size approximately of, let's say, roughly speaking, the Milky Way galaxy. So this might be a typical spiral galaxy in its early stages. The spiral arms are not very clearly developed in this particular one, but you can see how the spiral uh, arms of a galaxy start to evolve. So that's what happens over a period of time as matter falls through these filaments, drains through these filaments, in particular pockets, which become the accretion centers of what will ultimately be called a galaxy. The question is, do these galaxies look anything like the galaxies that we know exist in the sky? In the background here is a TNG 300, a large-scale simulation. It's been shown with the, uh, the brightest regions, the, the densest regions, shown as black rather than white, just so you can see the filamentary structure a little more clearly, perhaps. So on the largest scale, TNG 300 is telling us we've got what appears to be the filamentary structure of the web approximately right. But if we zoom into little areas, as indicated by these little red squares, we see various things in the simulation. Do these look anything like the galaxies that we see in the sky, for instance? Well, we can do a quick spot check and say, well, here we have two galaxies close together, and I'm not sure if it shows up too well for you, but there are little tails on the galaxies because they're interacting with each other. Do these look like real galaxies? Well, for instance, we can pick out a real pair of galaxies uh, which look very similar to this interacting pair here. And uh, a rather distorted pair of galaxies here. Yes, we can find galaxies in the sky which look very similar to the ones in our simulation. Not all galaxies have this structure. Some galaxies have a rather amorphous structure. Perhaps there's a hint of shells of stars in this particular galaxy. Yes, we see those in the sky as well. So it looks like almost everything that comes out of these simulations in terms of different types of galaxies, yes, it looks like we can find examples in the sky which indicate that these simulations are telling us something useful. They are showing us the sort of galaxies that exist in our universe. If we produced a simulation of lots of galaxies which look nothing like the galaxies we see out there, then our simulations are not telling us something useful about our universe. At the resolution of TNG 300, this is the biggest scale simulation, we don't expect to see too much in the way of detail. If we want to see detail within a galaxy, we need to look at a smaller box so we can look at it in more detail. 
So if we look at what do we get out of the TNG50, looking at 50 megaparsecs on a side, we see that we get loads of galaxies, including a whole load of disk galaxies, a whole load of spiral galaxies. On the left in color, that's indicating with the color scale where most of the hydrogen ends up when we make these galaxies after some 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. And if we assume that, well, where the hydrogen is, that's probably where most of the stars are going to be made, and let's assume that stars are a particular brightness, we can say, well, if this is where the hydrogen is, then we can basically predict what would those galaxies actually look like in terms of what starlight would we expect to see from those galaxies. And these are effectively the a family of a whole load of disk galaxies, a whole load of spiral galaxies that, that came out of the TNG50 simulations. And we don't have to compare them individually with known galaxies. We can look at those and say, yeah, those, like, those look like the sort of galaxies that we see, either in a small telescope or in the distant parts of the Hubble Deep Field. Yes, we see lots of galaxies that look like that. And therefore, we believe that these simulations are giving us realistic output, realistic in the sense of, yes, that is what is actually out there. Not only does it generate lots of interesting looking spiral galaxies, it generates quite a few that have a mass of order 100 to 200 to 300 billion stars, typical stars like our sun, for instance. In other words, roughly speaking, the same mass as our Milky Way, with the same number of stars as our Milky Way. And that is a fairly typical output of these simulations. And that is pretty much what the Milky Way looks like. Not necessarily exactly the same. Perhaps the spiral arms don't look identical. But it is certainly true the Milky Way looks something like that seen face on. And if we look at the Milky Way from the side, it is effectively a very thin disk with a little bit of a bulge in the middle often described as two fried eggs back to back. That's one way of thinking of the morphology of the Milky Way. So these simulations do generate lots of different types of galaxies, quite a diverse range of galaxies. They seem to match what we have in the sky. And these simulations spit out lots of galaxies that look like the Milky Way. In other words, there's nothing particularly special about the Milky Way. We don't have to fudge the simulation in order to produce something that looks like the galaxy in which we live. So that, again, is quite promising. So that's how galaxies form. Accretion of matter from the Big Bang. The matter forms filaments and voids, and matter drains through these filaments into these little nodes, these areas where matter accumulates at the highest density. That's where stars switch on. That's where galaxies start to form. But the B of the ABC is what's going on at the center of galaxies. Supermassive, supermassive meaning a black hole with the same mass of our sun, is what we would call a normal black hole or a stellar black hole. But supermassive means black holes that have a considerably higher mass than the sort of mass of our sun. And it appears that supermassive black holes um, exist at the heart of most, if not all, galaxies. We're not quite sure if every galaxy has one, but they seem to be quite common. Some black holes are very active in the sense that they are feeding. Matter is falling into these black holes and producing a huge amount of energy. In other galaxies, the black hole is not feeding. In other words, matter is not falling into the black hole. And the black hole is effectively dormant, a bit like a dormant volcano. And that's the situation with the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So how do we know what lies at the center of a galaxy? You might think it's relatively easy for our Milky Way compared to more distant galaxies, but actually it's almost as difficult because there's so many stars between us and the center of our galaxy. There's so much dust, there's so much other stuff, we don't get a clear view of the center of our galaxy. So it's taken us a while to figure out what is in the middle of our galaxy. But a number of experiments have been done. A number of telescopes, especially those that work in the infrared, have looked at what's going on at the center of the galaxy. In infrared, you don't worry so much about the amount of dust and gas that's there that tends to scatter the light. So you get a more detailed view of what's happening. 
and people have been monitoring what stars are doing close to the center of the galaxy, and they found that the stars are in orbit about something, something that cannot be seen, something that appears to be invisible but must be mass enough, massive enough to keep stars in orbit. So if it's massive but invisible, looks like it could be a black hole. This is the sort of experiment that's been done for quite a few years. They've mapped out the, the motion of stars. This is a tiny, tiny, tiny patch of sky centered around where we think the center of the Milky Way galaxy is. And they've monitored stars over a period of many years, observing how they move. And some of them have, are moving in quite distinct elliptical orbits from which you can determine they all seem to be orbiting around one point, which is at the uh, intersection of zero and zero here, a little dot right in the center. There is something that's holding all of those stars in their orbits. And just like from knowing that the Earth has a period of one year around the sun, you can work out what the mass of the sun must be, so, if you look at these stars, you don't have to know anything about the star's mass. You can simply observe how long does it take those stars to go around this object. From that, you can work out what the mass of the object is. And by taking lots of stars, you can make sure that you're not making any errors. You can do it lots of times and average them all out. And you find the only thing consistent with all of those orbits of stars is the fact that something right at the center of our galaxy must have a mass of approximately 4 million solar masses. This symbol here on the right, capital M, circle dot, that is the standard shorthand for the mass of our sun. There's nothing special about the mass of our sun. It's just a convenient unit. We don't want to have to keep using kilograms, so we're just going to use the mass of our sun as a unit. And the object that is holding all of these stars in orbit appears to have a mass of four million times the mass of our sun. And yet, that object must be tiny. If it was big, the stars would keep banging into it, but they don't. They are orbiting around it, so the object itself must be tiny. It's been determined that the object that's holding these stars in orbit is certainly smaller than our solar system and might be a few light hours or so in size. In other words, probably smaller than the orbit of Pluto. So something smaller than our solar system, but it has a mass of millions of times the mass of our sun. And the only object we know that fits that criterion for very large mass and very small size is a black hole. And it's nothing special about the Milky Way in the sense that we now think there are black holes probably at the center of all galaxies. So if we could see the Milky Way from outside, we can't, of course. We're stuck inside the Milky Way. And so that picture is actually what the Milky Way looks like from the inside. But let's just imagine that we could step out of the Milky Way and imagine that's what the Milky Way looks like as seen from the side. Lurking at the center is a supermassive black hole Hereafter, I'm just using the abbreviation SMBH. There's a supermassive black hole of 4 million solar masses. We can't see it in this picture, remember, because there's too much stuff in the way. We need to use rather special techniques to be able to see the orbits of these stars. But as I say, the Milky Way is not special because we've looked at other galaxies. We can't do this for galaxies a long way away, but some of the closer galaxies, we've started looking at them to see if we can see signs of a supermassive black hole in those galaxies. For instance, in Centaurus A, it's been determined that there, there's a supermassive black hole at the center with 100 million solar masses of mass there. So distinctly larger than the one at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Let's have a think about what happens if you get too close to a black hole. If a star happens to get close to a black hole, it can get totally and utterly shredded. There was a black hole lurking there, which you probably didn't spot, but now the star has got a little bit too close. The tidal forces from the black hole have shredded it, and the sun is being pulled into the black hole. But again, just like water being emptied from a bathtub, the water can't all go down the plug hole at the same time, so it ends up circulating in what's called an accretion disk. As the matter is trying to get into the black hole, it's producing this disk of, in a sense, a sort of a, a waiting room of lots of matter 
the inside of which is getting sucked into the black hole. But meantime, all of this matter that is circulating around is getting very hot and is radiating a considerable amount of energy. In fact, black holes are a very good way of converting matter into energy. It's a very efficient process. Perhaps up to a third or a half of the matter gets converted into energy in this particular process. And also, we get these rather unusual jets coming out. They are not coming from inside the black hole, because by definition, nothing can come out of a black hole. A black hole, remember, is a region from which nothing can escape not even light, which is why they're black. So energy can't be coming out of the black hole itself, but it can come from the region immediately around the black hole. So as well as having an accretion disk, it's sometimes observed that black holes can emit these jets. It's thought that the jets are related to the magnetic fields around the black hole, but because we haven't got any black holes really close to us, we can't study them particularly well. So again, this is an ongoing area where people are trying to understand what's going on. But we do know that some black holes produce jets. For instance, the galaxy M87. There's the galaxy, the big blob, but just sticking out. You can perhaps see at about 5 o'clock there. There's a jet coming out of that galaxy. If we image it with the Hubble Space Telescope, we can see that jet a little more clearly. So although the galaxy is huge, there must be a tiny, with respect to the size of the galaxy, a tiny black hole at the core that's producing jets coming out. There's probably jets coming out in both directions. In other words, roughly towards us and away from us. But the jet that's moving away from us is very difficult to see, and we can only see the one that is pointed, roughly speaking, in our direction. So there is actually another jet going off in the other direction. It's just nowhere near as bright. So we know these things exist, and in this particular case, you can see the jet is about the same size as the galaxy, which, <coughs> when you think of the galaxy containing half a trillion stars, that is a huge jet to be generated from something that is, let's say, only the size of a solar system or so. But in terms of trying to image what's actually going on, some of what I've shown you was just an artist's impression. Can we actually get a picture of a black hole? Well, we can't get a picture of a black hole per se because black holes do not emit enough light to be able to see what's going on. But perhaps you've heard of the Event Horizon Telescope um, a couple of years ago. It was uh, not, strictly speaking, a telescope, but lots of telescopes around the world were used in concert to actually produce something akin to a radio telescope about the size of the Earth itself. So all of these telescopes were looking at the same object at the same time. Then all of their data was collected together in order to give us the best possible image of a black hole. They tried imaging the black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, and they also chose one in a more distant galaxy. They are still crunching the numbers for the, for the Milky Way black hole, but they did manage to get an image of the black hole that I've just shown you, the one at the center of M87. So this is the one that's producing the jet we just had a look at. So what we're looking at is effectively the accretion disk. We can't see the black hole itself. The black hole is somewhere in the center of that black smudge in the middle, but what we're effectively looking at is an accretion disk. We're looking at the matter which is trying to fall into the black hole and in the process is getting very hot and in the process is radiating energy, which is then seen in this particular case, not in visible light, but in radio waves. It's a little difficult to try and work out why it looks like that. Why does it look like a donut and why is it brighter on one side compared to the other side? Well, a rather nice simulation that gives us an idea of why it looks like that. This is a, a simulation of the accretion disk. Seen from above, it just looks like a pancake. And seen from below, it just looks like a pancake. But if you look at it from the edge, it should be a little bit like Saturn's rings. It should be relatively thin. But it looks really weird. And that's because the black hole at the center has extremely strong gravity. And so light from what would be the more distant part, the far edge of this two-dimensional ring like Saturn's rings, that's been bent over the top of the black hole. 
not only that, but at the same time, you can see the underside of it, which again is bent by the extreme gravity of the black hole. So the black hole is warping and curving space so much, we get a very distorted view of the accretion disk that's forming around the black hole. But because it is an accretion disk and because matter is moving, some of that matter is moving towards us, in this case on the left-hand side, and that looks a little bit brighter than the matter on the right-hand side, which is moving away from us. And that's why the image we saw a moment ago has got some bright bits and some dark bits. It depends on how that accretion disk is rotating. So we now have a better idea of what's going on. It's not the most detailed view. If I go back to that, you can see that we're not getting the most detailed view, but the amount of effort that went into producing that because the accretion disk, remember, is not a huge object compared to the galaxy it's in. It's only about the size of a solar system. So to be able to see an object that small at a distance of one of our neighboring galaxies, you can see took a huge amount of effort. And this simulation just gives us an idea of what it is that we're viewing in that particular case. We can get an idea of just how energetic these jets can be if we're dealing with a, a large supermassive black hole. The one in uh, M87 there was not millions of times the mass of our sun, but some billions of times the mass of our sun. The jets that can be produced can be absolutely phenomenal. Here's a picture of a galaxy called Hercules A, this rather indistinct, smudgy-looking galaxy here which, as far as we can tell, is not a spiral galaxy. It doesn't have spiral arms. It's just something that looks a little bit like a rugby ball. It's actually quite big, because if we look at a galaxy which happens to be sitting next to it, as far as we can tell, if that is Hercules A, that would be what the Milky Way looked like if the Milky Way was sitting at the same distance. Okay, So it's not the Milky Way, but it just gives us an idea of scale. That object is about 150,000 light years across, so we can see Hercules A is a pretty big galaxy. But Hercules A is interesting because it has a supermassive black hole at its core, which is producing jets, which are absolutely enormous. And you can't see them in visible light, but if we switch from the Hubble's visible light to the radio emission picked up by the Very Large Array, then we realize that the jets produced by that galaxy are absolutely enormous. And you would think, well, if they've left the galaxy, what the hell are they slamming into here? They are simply, these jets are slamming into whatever is in between galaxies. And you would think that that would be nothing. Surely there's nothing between galaxies. There isn't much between planets. There's even less between stars. Surely there can't be much between galaxies. Well, that's true. There's very little out there, but these jets are so energetic, they are producing shock waves in the intergalactic medium. And you can see that if that's the size of the Milky Way, you can see that these things are sort of millions of light years or so in size. But they are being generated by an engine, the supermassive black hole, which might only be the size of the solar system buried deep in the heart of that galaxy. So the scales are truly outstanding. It's a very massive, very energetic object of ridiculously small size compared to the size of the jets that are ultimately visible when we look at these sorts of scales. The supermassive black hole that is taking matter from around it, feeding is the sort of colloquialism that we use. If a supermassive black hole is feeding, the surrounding stars and gas and anything else that's around is falling into the black hole. If that is the case, then we call that an active galactic nucleus. That's not necessarily the case. Our Milky Way has a black hole which is not feeding. So our Milky Way nucleus is not an active galactic nucleus. But quite a few of these objects that we've seen are. So whenever we see a galaxy with a very bright nucleus, we deduce that there must be a supermassive black hole producing that very bright nucleus. Of all of these active galactic, galactic nuclei, the most energetic are called quasars. These were observed back in the 1960s or so and 70s. 
and they can produce so much radiation that they can be seen from literally billions of light years. We can have a quasar on the other side of the observable universe and it can still be seen. In a related talk, I tried doing this as a lockdown challenge, as it were. I tried imaging a quasar without using a telescope. This is just using my camera, the camera I use to take pictures of wildlife. And it is possible, okay, it's not particularly spectacular, and if we blow it up, there's not much there, but the light that produced this little speck was captured by the camera without using a telescope, and this object is 25 billion light years away. It's literally on the other side of the observable universe. The light that generated that image has taken 90% of the age of the universe to get to us. It's that far away. And yet it's bright enough to be picked up without a telescope because of the huge amount of energy that quasars spit out. There are still some mysteries about what on Earth is going on with these supermassive black holes at the centres of galaxies. We know a lot of galaxies have them. We know the size of the galaxy is related to the size of the black hole at its core. Or, if you like, the size of the black hole is related to the size of the galaxy which hosts it. If we plot the, size, uh, the mass of the black hole versus the mass of the galaxy, Strictly speaking, it's not the mass of the galaxy, it's the mass of the galaxy in that central bulge. Some galaxies have larger central bulges than others. The Milky Way, for instance, has fairly large spiral arms, but not a particularly large bulge in the center of the galaxy. So the Milky Way comes down towards the bottom left of this diagram. Not a particularly large galaxy, and the supermassive black hole at its core is a few million times the size of our sun. But if we go to the other extreme, that's where, what we saw earlier with M87, the one that was imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. It's a relative monster of a galaxy, much larger than the Milky Way, and its black hole is billions of solar masses rather than many millions of solar masses. So there's definitely a relationship between the two. The bigger the galaxy, the bigger the black hole at its centre. But knowing that doesn't necessarily help. There is still the question, it's a chicken and egg question, why? Why do big galaxies have big black holes at the core? How did that happen? If we look at these simulations, that's one of the reasons people are doing simulations, to try and answer this sort of question. What actually happened in the early universe? Did black holes start to form and then galaxies grow around them? Or did galaxies form and then some stars died and produced black holes which then merged together to end up as a supermassive black hole at the center? Black holes first and then galaxies or galaxies and then black holes or did they sort of evolve side by side? There are details there we still don't understand in terms of that sort of evolution. And that's one reason why Telescopes such as the James Webb Space Telescope working in the infrared should be able to look back even further in time and look at the very earliest galaxies to find out is there any evidence that the very earliest galaxies already had supermassive black holes at their centre, yes or no. It's not going to be quite that black and white, but that's part of what James Webb is going to be researching. So we've seen accretion for forming galaxies, and we know that black holes are at the centre, but their role is still a little bit unclear. But the third element of the ABC is galaxy collisions, because we know that galaxies grow and change and evolve through collisions and mergers with other galaxies throughout the billions of years of their history. Whenever we look at an image like this, beautiful though it is, it looks very static, very pretty, but very static. Yes, we know galaxies are rotating, and we might say this galaxy rotates once in a few hundred million years, perhaps. But we still, even knowing that, we still tend to treat galaxies as static objects. However, over its lifetime, which of course can be many billions of years, because most galaxies formed fairly on in the universe's history, and here we are 13.8 billion years later observing these various structures, we want to understand how they change and how they grow. 
with a few static pictures like this, if we look at pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, we quite often see individual galaxies, but of course we quite often see multiple galaxies, interacting galaxies, galaxies that appear to be interfering with each other, distorting each other. The spiral arms are being disrupted when two galaxies get too close. So we can sort of tell from static pictures like this that something is going on. But we can't really tell how important galaxy collisions and galaxy mergers are just by looking at pictures. Even hundreds, even thousands of pictures don't tell us the full story. We can only really get a handle on what is going on with galaxies colliding and merging if we run simulations as a video and watch what happens. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to get a better appreciation of the evolution by looking at simulations. So here's a video, and you can see that it's not a lot of individual galaxies doing their own thing. It is an absolutely chaotic soup of galaxies. So the scale, again, we're talking about many megaparsecs of size here, and we're time scale over billions of years. Two galaxies are getting quite close in the center here. They seem to be almost pulling each other. They seem to have merged. No, not quite. Oh, yep, yeah. okay, they're getting there. Now they seem to have merged into one larger galaxies. That is how galaxies grow. They eat each other. Gal galaxies are cannibals, basically. At the end of this particular simulation, what do we see? Well, we see a small number of quite large galaxies and a large number of small galaxies. Is that how things really are? When people looked at the Milky Way, they say, well, the Milky Way appears to be, well, quite large. It appears to have a few hundred million stars in it. But we only seem to have about 10 satellite galaxies, 10 small galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way. But these simulations sort of imply that shouldn't we have more like 100 rather than 10? So maybe the simulations are wrong. Well, that's what was thought until they went back and did better observations with bigger telescopes and more sensitive instruments. And now they realize that the Milky Way actually has more satellite galaxies than we first thought. It's not just 10 or so. It is more like 100. I can't remember what the actual number is. But yes, there are a large number of satellites around the Milky Way, just like these sorts of simulations would have us believe. Let's just run that simulation again. Every time I watch this, I see something different. So there's a galaxy coming in from the top, a galaxy coming in from the bottom. Eventually, they will merge in the middle. And we can watch that again. There's also other galaxies which have coming flying in from one side. We see this one, for instance. If you follow that one, if I can hold my red pointer still enough, you can see that gets completely shredded as it passes other galaxies. The tidal effects of very strong gravity from one galaxy can disrupt smaller galaxies. And again, we've seen that one merge there. We also get the hint here. You can see that the background is not black. That's not an error. The background not being black is telling us that there is stuff between galaxies. There is gas that hasn't yet been actually formed into galaxies. So the intergalactic medium, the space between galaxies, is still full of hydrogen. Very low density, but it is full of hydrogen, which is why if jets come out of a galaxy, they can produce the sort of shock waves we saw from Hercules A, for instance. Static pictures like those from Hubble, if Hubble looks at a galaxy cluster, it has taken hundreds, if not thousands, of images like this one. When you look at galaxy clusters, you quite often find most of them are relatively orangey or red, and most of them are relatively amorphous. In other words, they are elliptical galaxies. Sometimes you can see some smaller, bluer galaxies that seem to have spiral arms. But in these clusters, you seem to get many more red elliptical galaxies than you do blue spiral galaxies. And that tells us something about the process, even without doing simulations. That tells us that if we're looking at a galaxy cluster where things are really crowded, surely if a cluster is really crowded, that means there must be even more collisions than normal going on. And if we see mainly elliptical galaxies rather than spiral galaxies, that tells us that if galaxies collide with each other, they tend to end up as red elliptical galaxies. In other words, you can start with a whole load of bluish 
spiral galaxies, if you allow them to collide, the spiral arms eventually disappear. You can just about deduce that from lots of individual images like this, but also that's backed up by the simulations that I've been showing you. We can use that to get an idea of what will happen, happen with the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy. They are close enough that even though the universe is expanding and tends to carry the galaxies apart, the Milky Way and Andromeda are close enough that they are gravitationally attracted to each other. Triangulum galaxy isn't going to do much, but if we play this forward for a few billion years, we find that the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy are going to collide, and in doing so, they will both strip each other's spiral arms off, and you will end up with something that looks a little bit like an elliptical galaxy. And that, we think, is common to all such collisions. So here, the galaxies pass through each other at 4 billion years. No stars will collide, probably, when galaxies move through. A little bit while later, they will come back again, and the two will start to merge through each other once again, then through each other, and eventually they settle down after five or six billion years into an amorphous mess, which doesn't contain any spiral arms. Spiral structures generally don't survive galaxy collisions, so as, um, depending on the size of the galaxies. Yes, a galaxy can eat up smaller galaxies, but if large galaxies collide, they tend to disrupt each other to the point where you no longer end up with a spiral arm structure. That's M33 in the background watching as these two collide. If we think about what it would look like from our point of view, there's the Milky Way that we see, of course, from the inside. So we're looking at spiral arms from the inside. And there's the Andromeda galaxy, a favorite target for many astrophotographers. That's what it looks like now. But if we fast forward a billion years, one giga year, the Andromeda galaxy will be a little bit closer. It'll still look pretty much the same, because that's still a little bit too far for the tidal effects of both galaxies to interfere with each other. So in one billion years, Andromeda will be larger, but look pretty much the same. In three and a bit billion years, the Andromeda galaxy is looming on us, but still looks sort of the same in that we can still see spiral structure. It's getting a little bit distorted on one side compared to the other, because one side is a little bit closer to us than the other. But it's interesting to see what happens when we move forward a few hundred million years and the two galaxies pass through each other. There's so much space between the stars, it's very unlikely two stars will actually go bang into each other. Most of the stars will pass through, but the tidal effects, the gravity effects, will be felt throughout the galaxy. And because as they pass through each other, one, the gravity from one galaxy is going to be tugging on the other, it's almost certainly going to disrupt all of the hydrogen gas that's in both of the galaxies. So it may not harm any of the stars, but it is almost certainly going to make the hydrogen clouds start to collapse and produce new stars. So what we're seeing here, these pink regions, they're a bit of a mess, but pink is effectively telling us we are getting new star formation. So as well as the two galaxies passing through each other, it's going to stimulate new star formation. And if we go another 100 or so million years into the future, we see the sky is an absolute riot of new star formation. We can't, we can't see the Milky Way any, anymore. We can't see the Andromeda galaxy anymore. It is essentially impossible to point at any star and say, was that part of the Milky Way or was it part of Andromeda? They've essentially lost their identity. After four billion years, a lot of stars have moved through and they've separated, as we saw in that earlier simulation, they've separated, and now we have a rather messy-looking Milky Way and an Andromeda galaxy, which doesn't really look like a spiral galaxy anymore because those spiral arms have been so heavily disrupted. But after a little while, they'll come back together again, and after about five billion years, we will end up in a galaxy which is not totally amorphous, but we seem to have one nucleus over here and one nucleus over there, and virtually no spiral arms. They've just got two nuclei of a very large elliptical galaxy. 
maybe we won't really care because remember in five billion years our sun will start to change into a red giant so maybe we will have other problems to think about but it would be nice to think that that's what the sky might look like five billion years hence what will happen to these two nuclei in the galaxy one thing we'll have to decide is what to call this galaxy it's no longer the milky way it's no longer the andromeda galaxy is it Milkdromeda? Um, is it uh, Andrilke? Uh, is it, is it Androway? Uh, we've got five billion years to decide, so we don't have to decide just yet, but at some point we have to decide what to call this galaxy, and eventually these two nuclei, although in principle they might be orbiting with um, each other for a while, each of these nuclei contains one of these supermassive black holes, and eventually they are going to do what black holes do, which is merge and produce a huge amount of gravitational waves and probably a huge amount of energy. It's been postulated, we don't know, but it might be that when the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy collide with each other, after a little while we may end up with a merged supermassive black hole which is bigger than either of the two in the Milky Way or Andromeda and it could turn our galaxy into a quasar. Because there will be so much matter falling into this black hole, the amount of energy pouring out of the center of this galaxy could be absolutely huge. And that will be bad news for pretty much anybody in the galaxy, but again, I remind you, we've got a red giant star to worry about, so maybe this is the lesser of two problems. But it might well be that the collision of Andromeda and the Milky Way could produce a quasar which is visible on the other side of the universe. Just like distant quasars are visible to us, it could be that our own galaxy ends up being visible from huge distances tens of billions of light years away. Just a thought. So that's the ABC. A for accretion, matter accretes under the influence of gravity, all of the matter made in the Big Bang, all of the hydrogen, plus presumably all of the dark matter as well, even if we don't know what that is. All of that accreted to form the galaxies. Somewhere along the way, supermassive black holes were made. Was that very early or was that a later thing? We don't know. We need to look at some of the earlier galaxies and run these simulations very carefully to try and work out, have black holes been there all the time or are they a recent addition? And we know that the evolution of galaxies is dominated the growth of galaxies is dominated by collisions and mergers. Small galaxies end up as huge galaxies if you give them long enough because they eat their neighbors effectively. So next time you see beautiful images or even a little fuzzy blob down an amateur telescope, but certainly whenever you look at images like these taken from world-beating telescopes, I hope you remember the A, the B, and the C. Thank you for listening.